Hey everybody, it's Dr. Galvin with today's coronavirus update, part two. We, we did part one yesterday. There's lots to cover, so I didn't want to do it all in one video. Uh, we went over numbers uh, yesterday of note, you know, they, they continue to go up. Of note today though, um, in North Carolina, 1,109 hospitalized patients, which is the highest number of hospitalizations we've had since this all started, who are admitted to the hospital with, with coronavirus. Um, and so those are concerning numbers, and we talked a little bit about that yesterday, about the fact that these are probably sicker people being admitted to the hospital than were admitted initially because of our physician concerns that we didn't really know what was going on, and we probably had a low threshold for admitting people earlier, but now we've you know, learned how to treat this, and we were much more um, you know, careful about whom we admit and whom we don't admit, so those 1,100 people are probably fairly sick. I'm um, going to couple, talk about a couple things today. Schools reopening, particularly in North Carolina. Um, the risk of smoking and vaping in COVID. And we're going to talk about this Dr. Bartlett in Texas who claims he's found a cure for COVID. And uh, we're going to talk about why that probably is not true and, and some reasons why that is. First off, schools, and it was fairly serendipitous that I decided to wait till today because I didn't realize it, but the governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, just announced that we're going to go with Plan B in North Carolina, which is sort of you know, a compromise, best of both worlds, worst of worst, both worlds. I don't know what what that means exactly, but basically it's a combination of in-person instruction with limited attendance at the schools and so kind of a hybrid of online and in-house. And I don't know exactly the logistics of how it's gonna work. They're not gonna let the schools be higher than 50% 50, 50 occupancy. Um, I understand that all the kids are going to have to wear masks, which I think will be interesting to try to you know, enforce that in schools. There is going to be a virtual option, so if, if there's a family who is either very concerned or I think the more realistic thing is someone that's got you know, somebody in the household that's high risk, maybe somebody who's getting chemo, is chronically ill, maybe a kid who lives with grandparents or older with the underlying medical problems then that there's going to be an option for doing a virtual only schooling for that child. Do I worry about kids going back to school? You know, I've already done a video about this and, and my reading of the data that's out there tells us a couple things. And I think the American Association of Pediatrics agrees with me. One of those things is that children are, are far less likely to get COVID at all. And when they do get it, they don't get very severe disease. And you know, the number of, of severe COVID cases in, in kids who are less than 16 is, is minuscule. There's been barely any uh, case reports at all. And the ones that have been sick have been kids who have been chronically ill anyway. So um, they had underlying problems, but healthy children don't usually have problems with this. The other thing is that there has not been a lot of studies that have linked case outbreaks to children being the primary source. And it may be the fact that, you know, big people, big lungs, lots of air exchange, lots of potential virus exchange, little people, little lungs, maybe less, plus they're, they're not getting as sick, so maybe they're not, they're able to fight off the virus in some way, viral loads may be lower. I'm not exactly sure what, but we know that we have not been able to really make a causative link between big outbreak coming from children. There's been a few things that have suggested, maybe, but, for the most part, most of these outbreaks get attracted to adults and the kids are just incidental. The other thing is, you know, in other countries that have kind of gone through the spike, kind of survived through it, and as the spike has kind of come down and those numbers have come down, many of them have reopened schools. And what we have not seen as they reopened schools was a subsequent spike of cases after schools were open. So again, I think kids going to school themselves are at low risk, but we gotta be, you know, we've gotta look after the most vulnerable people, which may be potentially teachers, administrators, you know, people that are in the service roles in the school and the, the folks who are at home that may get exposed to a kid who may get, you know, catch it from somebody at school. So plan B is what's gonna be done here in North Carolina. Again, I don't know completely what those specifics are, but um, it seems like it's a compromised position and hopefully they'll be able to do it in a way that's safe and, and, and effective, both from the health perspective and also the education uh, piece of it, because we know that kids do better when they're, they're getting in-person instruction, especially the younger kids, because, you know, it's obviously difficult to, to, to teach a, a you know, first grader, 
Virtually, and the other thing is that the parents need to be much more involved. And some parents have the wherewithal and the, and the resources to take the time to do that, but other parents have to work. And you know, if they're only going to school one week out of three, that really is disruptive for, for work life as well. So we'll see how that, that pans out. I'm gonna talk a bit about smoking and vaping and the risk. And um, I don't know if I may have shared this in another video, but you know, early on in the, um, in the pandemic, we had a very young uh, patient that came in in his you know, early to mid 20s who had COVID and was very, very sick. And I think ultimately we ended up intubating him and he really did not do well and he was healthy. And it, it didn't make a, a lot of sense initially why, you know, why this particular kid did so poorly. Um, I think he did survive, but he was in the ICU for quite a period of time. And the one thing that one of his friends did mention to me as I was kind of trying to get some more history was that he was a very heavy vapor. And then we've seen sort of this vape lung. Um, so this, you know, people that do a lot of vaping can damage the lung and that probably predisposed this kid for a more severe infection. And now we've been, you know, dealing with this pandemic worldwide for some period of time. And we've got some science to sort of back that up. Um, there was a University of California review of 19 peer reviewed studies that looked at cases in China, Korea, and the US, I believe. And I think there are about close to 12,000 patients that were involved in all of these, these studies. And what they found was that the, the people that smoke, the smokers in that group, were about 30% of that smoking group went on to develop severe disease whereas only about 17 and a half percent of the non-smokers did. So it seems that smoking predisposed people for progressing to the more severe forms of disease, which could potentially you know, lead to intubation and ICU stays. And also, you know, those are the ones that, that are gonna probably have the risk of dying much more than, so than someone develops mild symptoms. Um, those are similar to some numbers that were in a, a World Health Organization study as well. And I think we're sort of seeing that smoking is a, is a fairly consistent risk across many of these studies, population-based studies about COVID infection, um, just as it's a risk for other things, but vaping you know, is no safer. And it looks, you know, there haven't been specific studies looking at only vaping, but I can tell you that anecdotally, from what I've seen, from what I've heard from other, uh, other doctors, um, vaping, especially people that vape very heavily, um, are at risk. And then, you know, another anecdotal thing from one of my patients who owns a number of bars and restaurants here in Charlotte, he went to reopen a couple of his um, bars for food service, and he actually stopped the whole process because he went in and as they were prepping the, the restaurant, he found that all of his employees were not only were they vaping, but they were sharing the vape pens. And he's like, no way, we're not going to do this because we are going to definitely, if one gets it, they're all going to get it if they're going to be, you know, this you know, this bright and share vape pens. And, you know, we know that there's this big, you know, amongst younger people, less of a concern about COVID and they're making kind of poor choices. And so I think that particular person made probably a decent decision. The last thing I want to talk about today is I've sent, you guys have sent me a, a lot of uh, people have sent me this video from this Dr. Richard Bartlett in, in Texas, who basically claims he's got a silver bullet for COVID using palmicord or budesonide, which is an inhaled steroid, and you know, that this is gonna cure the disease. And you know, unfortunately, you know, the guy seems like a pretty legitimate doctor. I don't know why he made this claim because there, uh, it's fraught with errors. Um, first off, you know, he presents no data at all. He just says that, you know, he's, he's treated, you know, a dozen or so people since March and they've all survived. Well, I hope so. I've, I've treated more than a dozen patients since March and they've all survived as well. So I certainly hope they survived. Um, we don't know anything about the patients. We don't know how sick they were. We also know that m the majority of people that get COVID are going to survive. Um, and he's claiming that the, the inhaled steroid is what did it. And then he makes a claim that, you know, the reason that they haven't had you know high numbers in many Asian countries is that they're using it. Well, there's zero evidence that they're using budesonide in Asia to treat COVID, zero. And there are no studies whatsoever looking at the use of, of inhaled steroids in treating COVID. Now, there's a couple studies that are out there looking at the possibility and they're enrolling people, but nothing's been started. There have been some pretty good reviews and looking to see if people who are chronically using these medicines, which are asthmatics, they typically use these inhaled steroids, 
whether they're safe to using COVID. And, and the general consensus from those studies is that it is safe to continue to use those medicines if you're, um, if you're having it. But there's not a single study or any evidence, and he doesn't present any evidence other than, oh, you know, this is my personal experience that this is going to be a reasonable treatment. And, you know, th there's actually not been a lot of discussion about it because there, there, it's, he just basically made this claim on a TV show and provided no evidence at all. And, you, you know, how we, we talked about you need to have decent evidence and, and he doesn't, you know, provide bad evidence. He just doesn't provide any. He just says, I treated 12 people. They all got better. It's a silver bullet. And I, I think that, you know, is there some veracity there? Who knows? I can't tell you. Um, you know, like I said, we could give those people raisins or give them M&Ms. And if they got better, does it mean raisins or M&Ms made them better? Probably not, but you know, we need to probably study that. So I would not get your hopes up about budesonide being a miracle treatment. There are some pending studies that are being proposed. They're trying to recruit patients for them. And maybe once more data is actually available from more than one person, and more than 12 patients, we, we can actually make an uh, educated, you know, opinion about it. But at this point, I wouldn't uh, put too much stock in it. Um, and again, it's not being used like he claims in Asia for, you know, thousands and millions of people. Uh, I'm going to end it there. We are going to do, I'm working on doing a Q&A and I haven't decided whether we're going to do a Facebook Live or a, did you just sort of questions in Q&A. I think we'll try a Facebook Live again, maybe on Friday afternoon. We'll we'll, we'll try one. Um, maybe uh, I'll, I'll post it on our Facebook page what what we're gonna do. Um, and I think what I may do is just do an update live. And as questions come in, if there's some interesting questions, I'll answer them. But I'll have people put questions in, and then I will try to get um, a couple of my colleagues to come on next week, and we'll do another Q and A. Um, we'll see if we can get Dr. Hogenkamp, maybe Dr. Bream, um, uh, maybe one or two others, and we can start collecting questions. Um, but I haven't uh, completely decided. I'll let you guys know this week. As usual, if you find this valuable, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. We'll be back with more content this week. Um, we just finished a whole series on weight loss. And we're gonna be moving on to other wellness topics, including immunity, including hormones, uh, exercise, fitness, sleep, stress management. We've got a whole uh, number of things planned. In the meantime, wash your hands, take care of yourselves, take care of your families, take care of those around you. We'll get through this and I will talk to you soon. Have a great afternoon.